Welcome back to the Word on Fire show. I'm your host, Jared Zimmer, and as always, we have with us Bishop Robert Barron. Bishop, it's so good to chat with you again. Jared, always a joy to be on with you. How are you kids doing today? Doing good, doing good. Ready for uh, the end of school. <laughs> They're all taking over Texas, I bet, your kids. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we've got enough for a football team, pretty much. You too. So. <laughs> So, Bishop, you recently had an opportunity to go to St. Anselm College in New Hampshire. What was the reason for the visit? Well, I've got a great friend there, Father Benedict Gavin, who is one of the monks at St. Anselm's Abbey. And he and I uh, were in Paris together getting our doctorates many years ago. So I've known Benedict forever. So he invited me to, um, to receive one of the honorary doctorates this year from St. Anselm. So I was, it was a joy to go see him, first of all, and then to... Um, kind of honor this place, which I think is a great school. People might know it from the presidential debates, because every four years, one of the major debates is held at St. Anselm's College. Um, so anyway, I went there, and that long, long flight, you know, from L.A. to Boston, it's one of the longest flights you can take in the continental U.S. But I did that and then and was driven up to New Hampshire. Um, so it was a joy. It was great. And uh, met a number of Word on Fire supporters there, a number of the young uh, students, many of whom are thinking about priest or moving toward priesthood. So it was just, uh, it was a great pleasure for me. Well, praise God. So how many doctorates is that for you now? <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, four. I've got four honorary doctorates. <laughs> You're a living example that Catholicism is intelligent. <laughs> uh, so in today's episode, uh, we're going to continue our discussion regarding the eight principles of the Word on Fire movement. You know, really the the pillars of the the lifestyle and kind of the the way of seeing the world, which we at Word on Fire really try to live. You know, in the last two episodes, we discussed uh, Christocentrism and evangelizing the culture. Uh, so continuing this conversation, we're going to discuss the third pillar of the Word on Fire movement, which is the special commitment to new media. You know, really, since its inception, Word on Fire has had a vision of new media and, and really all of the latest technologies as, as powerful resources to connect with those who are far removed from Christ. You know, this, this boom in how we connect with one another, with, with people all over the world in just a matter of seconds, has opened up a profound chance for us to, uh, for uh, those of us wishing to evangelize, really to go beyond the periphery. You know, and Bishop, as you often say, evangelists like Fulton Sheen would have given their right arm for the majority of what people have now have access to. Unbelievable. No, you're right. And, you know, only to look at this thing, Christocentrism, for example, I think any any Catholic movement or order or organization would be Christocentric. As central as that is, it's, of course, important to emphasize it, but it wouldn't be distinctive. Now, today, we're getting to one of the really distinctive marks of Word on Fire, which is this um, um, enthusiastic use of the new media. This is a moment. Vatican II talks about reading the signs of the times, right? Now, I've complained that my generation often receive that principle as ape the world. <laughs> I mean, whatever the world's doing, church ought to get on that bandwagon. <clears throat> of course, that's not what it means at all. You read the signs of the times through the lens of Christ. Well, one of the signs of our time, I think, is the emergence of these new media. Now, we read those through the lens of Christ, and we'll get to maybe some of the negatives in a bit, and you see negative dimensions of the new media. But you also, I think, by God, see lots of positive dimensions to the new media and ways it can be used to propagate the gospel. Just as Paul used the media of his own time, so we use the media available to us. As you say, even from Fulton Sheen's time 50 years ago, there's been an explosion of these new means of communication. And so if we don't use them, we're not reading and interpreting properly the signs of the times. I think one of those signs of the times was a statistic that you shared recently in one of your talks that more people today own a smartphone, which is about 4 billion people, than own a toothbrush, which is about 3.5 billion. <laughs> if that's yeah. not a sign of the times. Right. And we've got to be uh, attentive to that and then take advantage of it for the sake of the gospel. What it means, of course, is that we have uh, a, a means of communicating with each other that's almost unprecedented in human history. Um, the gospel is all about communication, isn't it? It's good news. So think of, I go on TV or I listen to the radio or the internet to get the news, right? Well, we're all about spreading news. 
And that means we got to use whatever is available to us, as long as we do it within the confines of the law and morality. But we use what's available to us. And that's part of the word on fire charism that we've we've enthusiastically embraced this possibility. What characteristic of new media would you say makes it so darn effective for evangelization today? Look at the connectivity. You know, uh, I can't think of a, a better way in human history to reach out to more people and to connect with them. So the very fact that you can not only reach people, but you can share information, share video, share uh, impressions. You can comment to one another. I can link in a blink of an eye to someone all the way across the planet. I can share information, share enthusiasm, share imagery, um, share videos. You know, something can happen. I take an iPhone video of it, and then like that, it can be in Nepal. It can be in the South China Sea. You know, that capacity to span the globe is just um, is just unprecedented. And to connect with people, uh, we'll get to the the negatives, but I, I want to stay with the positive for a, a while here that I don't know of any other time in human history that we can have a sense of, of outreach like this. I'm talking to you and I'm also looking at you right now. We're doing this by Skype and I can see you in, in Fort Worth, Texas. You see me in Santa Barbara. Our words are, are going out now to people in principle all over the world. Um, it would be a crime if the church didn't take advantage of this opportunity. It reminds me of the the St. Paul using the Roman roads, right? Using yeah. the things that were already set up and using them for the glory of the gospel. Right. And the Roman roads were used for all kinds of bad things, too. You know, so they were using Roman armies to, to uh, you know, conquer and to, and to pillage and all that. But they were also used for a lot of good things. And they connected that empire in a way that was, for the time, unprecedented. And then along comes Shaul of Tarsus, uh, who saw the risen Jesus and realized his job was to tell the whole world it had a new Lord. How do you do it? Well, you write things down on parchment, and you give them to people who are going across those Roman roads to other cities. You yourself get on those Roman roads, and you travel around what we now call Asia, uh, Turkey, you know, Asia Minor, Greece, etc. You eventually make your way to Rome by those Roman roads, because Rome is the center of, uh, of civilization. Paul was, was enthusiastically embracing the means available to him. Um, the fact that now we can quite literally proclaim Paul's uh, writings from the rooftops through satellite dishes and so on. Um, that's just very much in his own spirit. So what then might be a danger as far as if evangelists don't get involved with new media? We'll get so behind the curve that everyone else's message will be communicated, not ours. So, you know, again, this is we live in a finite, conflictual, sinful, fallen world, Right which means whatever is good can be twisted to bad purposes. Is the internet used for all kinds of nefarious stuff? Of course it is. It's used by human beings. Are lots and lots of bad messages going out over all these means of communication? Of course. you know. So if we don't get into that game, then we just get hopelessly behind the curve. We can say, oh, we'll retreat to the hills, or we won't use it, or oh, it's all so corrupt. But then everyone else will out-narrate us. Where are young people especially found? They're found in this world. They're found in the internet world. Well, we can, we can throw our hands up and surrender and say, oh, that's just a, it's a you know, swamp of corruption. Well, yeah, it is in many ways. But we can also get in there with a rival message. And that's what I've advocated now for years. I think also one of the dangers is that we end up becoming irrelevant if we're not yeah. in that world. No, that's, that's my point, that we'll just get out-narrated. We'll just yeah. simply be marginalized. And then the Christian message won't be heard. What if Paul had said, oh, over those terrible Roman roads come the you know uh, marauding and conquering Roman armies. I'm not going to use them. Or you know, letters, oh, they're used for all kinds of nefarious purposes. I'm not going to write a letter. Well, I mean, come on. So we need to use our version of the Roman roads and, and letters and get our message out. And one example that we had already mentioned, but I want to go a little bit further into is Venerable Fulton Sheen, you know, really a, a shining example of somebody that used the means by which he currently had at his hands. Um, and really somebody that's been a hero of, of Word on Fire and actually been a hero for me. One of my sons is actually named Fulton right. uh, after him. Um, right. So what was it that made him so effective and, and what can we learn from him and his approach? Oh, yeah, there's so much. I mean, I think, first of all, what we've been talking about, 
about, that he was um, ready, willing, and able to use the media that were available to him. And at that time, it meant radio and television. Now, mind you, there were a lot of people at the time, especially with television, that were saying to Sheen, oh, no, no, don't do this. It's going to, you know, it's crude. It's going to compromise the gospel. If you're on the same, you know, channels as Milton Berle and, and, and all this, it, it's going to be, um, it's going to make a mockery of the gospel. There were a lot of people at the time saying just that, and Sheen didn't buy it. And so I, I'm in a very small way trying to imitate that spirit of his. Then you look at Sheen himself, and I've said these things before many times, but first of all, you see his supreme intelligence. Sheen was a very well-educated uh, Catholic thinker, writer. The Agrégé degree, this, this uh, elevated philosophical degree from the Catholic University of Louvain. Someone had taught for 20-some years at Catholic University. Someone well-versed in the intellectual tradition tradition of the Catholic Church. This was not a fly-by-night, you know, televangelist type that I, I, I've read a couple of books and now I'm ready to talk to the world. And this is someone who is really steeped in the intellectual tradition. Then I think someone, and I love this about Sheen, he did not dumb down the message. Watch his shows now. He was not giving university lectures. I, I'll grant you that. But he was not dumbing down the message. He was not condescending to his audience. He was not playing a kind of simplistic game. He, he honored his audience, you know, by sharing some sophisticated, substantive material with them. I think, thirdly, his great skill as a communicator, and a lot of that has to do with articulate speech, but also with a gift for analogy. To me, it's one of the great marks of most communicators is they have a gift for analogy. This thing I'm trying to explain to you, you know, it's like that thing, which you know very well. Any teacher, from, from a kindergarten teacher to graduate school, will tell you the key to teaching is start where they are and then make it an analogous comparison to, to what you're trying to communicate, right? You say, hey, you know what this thing that you know about? Well, what I'm telling you, it's kind of like that, but it's a little bit different. Well, Sheen was a master at that, it seems to me, of analogical speech, to use the technical uh, terminology. He had a training in oratory. Now, I know that's changed in our time. And we could talk, that could be a whole other show, I suppose. But Sheen was trained in kind of classical oratorical techniques. And actually, if you watch him, you can you can just go through the classic oratorical moves that, that go back even to the ancient world. Even his use of humor. I mean, that's a uh, that's an old, I don't want to say trick, but it's an old oratorical device, you know, because all speakers know this, at least implicitly. When you stand up in public to speak, whether your audience admits it or not, or really knows it, there's a resentment. Because who are you? Who's this guy to stand up and tell me what to what to think, right? So what speakers from time immemorial have done is called the captatio benevolentiae, the, the grabbing of benevolence, right? And you do it often through humor, usually of a self-deprecating uh, type. Well, now watch Sheen. He's a master at that, you know? So yeah, out comes this fellow with the you know the Episcopal robes and the cape and the hat. And I'm sure a lot of Americans, especially those suspicious of Catholics, would have said, "Who is this guy? Who does he think he is with the cape on?" And you know, so what Sheen would do typically is he begin with a with a little light remark or self deprecating. Uh, he was gone for a time. I think he was sick or he's away or something, and he'd been away for several weeks. And his opening line was, "Long time no Sheen." So I mean, those are, <laughs> those are old tricks. And I, I mean that as a compliment. <laughs> Those are old devices. And uh, and then watch him now as, as you go through his talks. He's using a lot of the classical oratorical uh, devices. So all those things contributed to his effectiveness. And it's interesting how he almost um, came about again with the upcoming generation. You know, the, the, the interest and enthusiasm about Fulton Sheen came about again through, say, my generation coming up. He started showing up on YouTube and showing up on EWTN again. Um, and it, he was a big reason why my wife and I started taking our faith very seriously because of those very facts that you just stated. It's, it's fascinating because, as I've said before, he skipped my generation. So my parents watched him. Uh, my dad, who was not an easily impressed guy, was deeply impressed by Fulton Sheen. But now we're going back in the 50s, right? Maybe early 60s. When my generation came along, especially those was involved in the church, no one watched Fulton Sheen or no one read him. He would have been seen, if you thought about him as, oh, yeah, 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 our parents liked him and this kind of old-fashioned guy, and you know, with the cape and the... See, what also happened, Jared, is, is a practical thing, but 
the 60s and 70s intervened. And what became a high ideal in the 60s and 70s was authenticity or honesty or directness in speech. And, and I get it. I mean, there was a real cultural change. So if I came out today, for example, wearing a cape and gesturing in the way Sheen does in that kind of self-consciously theatrical way, it, it probably wouldn't work because things have just shifted around, you know. So when my generation uh, watched him, if we did, we would say, oh, no, that's you know, pre-Vatican II and all this. But then, as you say, he skipped in a way. And your generation, and I knew your generation when I was at the seminary teaching, they rediscovered Fulton Sheen. And to be frank with you, after you know a generation of kind of namby-pamby superficial preaching, uh, I think they, they responded to Sheen because they got the meat, they got the substance. And maybe the theatricality they could look beyond, but they, they caught the, the substance of Sheen. And so, right, your generation rediscovered him. And that's all to the good. That's a, I'm in praise of your generation. And then to kind of switch gears just a little bit um, is I know there's some things that people do struggle with when it comes to new media. You know, it's interesting because at a time when we are literally more connected than we've ever been in all of history, we've also statistically been shown to feel less connected than ever. Uh, yeah. to people. And so what advice might you have for our listeners for that sort of disconnectedness that we can still feel even though we are so connected? Right. And you're putting your finger on the on the paradox. And it really is. It is it's a, a cultural problem. We're connected, but we're connected often in a virtual way. Um, now, you and it's pretty close now. We're doing the Skype thing and I can actually see you. You can see me. So there's there's kind of a immediacy, you know, but nevertheless, we're not in the same room uh, talking to each other, physically present to each other. Now, a fortiori, as people use all these different means of communication, and they're connecting, but secondhand, thirdhand, fourthhand, um, there can be a turning in on oneself that happens through the social media. I mean, and I, I, it's funny, even 10 years ago, I didn't have, even have a cell phone. I, did, I didn't have a smartphone. Now, I'll have to catch myself sometimes. All right, you're, you're focusing on that stupid machine too much. You need to check, check an email. And, you know, in the, in the Facebook feed that we all get now, well, all right, and some things will pop up that are kind of interesting. But I'll find myself sometimes just almost obsessively or addictively looking at it. And you think, well, this is ridiculous. You know, here's the world out there. Or I find myself, I'm sure you have the same experience. You be with a bunch of people, and we're all looking at our stupid little I, iPhones. Well, that's a problem, you know, and uh, it can turn us away from a real direct involvement. My advice would be use the social media. Don't rest in the social media. Let them be a means to the end of real connection to people. And I would set a limit to it. I have a little, um, you know, hourglass thing on your desk. If you're going to use the, the Internet or like your iPhone just for a time and make sure it's limited, uh, put the iPhone away. At certain times of the day, like one thing I do, for example, when I wake up in the morning, I will look at it to make sure that, you know, no important emails or things came overnight. But then I just put it on the table and I go and do my holy hour and make absolutely sure it's nowhere near me during the holy hour. I think at certain points during the day, do that. Uh, put away the social media. And um, how about look someone in the eyes and talk to them, <laughs> you know? So I, I like them, and I'm, a, I'm wary of them, too, because of this distanciation that happens. And then, I don't know if you this piece I just wrote a short time ago, I think we did a video on it, too, uh, based on an article I really liked by a woman that said you know, she came of age in the social media uh, era, and she realized that her whole life was not so much lived as presented for an audience. You know what I mean? So whatever I'm doing, well, make sure we get a picture of it, put it up on Facebook, Ask for comments, whatever you're thinking, put it up on the Facebook page and ask people to respond and how many likes you got and how many people are following you. Well, the problem there is that you start living your life as though you're constantly on stage before an audience and you're not really living your life anymore. You're kind of reporting on your life from a distance. That's a problem, too. And I, I know another difficulty that, that people struggle with when it comes to becoming evangelists in new media is they are afraid of some of the, the possible negative feedback that they might get. As you mentioned, Fulton Sheen got yeah. it. You know, uh, anytime you throw something up online, you're, you're, you're kind of opening up yourself to that possibility of negative comments. Yeah. 
And so what advice would you have for our listeners that, that do want to engage but are a little bit fearful of that? Good. It's a good question. And go right back, though, to, let's say, the early days of the uh, Franciscan movement, when St. Francis, in his, in his wonderful sort of naivete almost, sent these brothers off as missionaries. You go to Germany, you go to Hungary, you go to Spain, you go to, to Muslim land. What happened to them? They were almost all killed, <laughs> or at the very least, they were abused and they were they were tortured. So I mean, you think we have it bad? <laughs> if someone makes a snarky comment, you know, uh, it's not as bad as you know getting your head cut off. So <laughs> you have to first put it in perspective. But then, see, secondly, that's the way it's always gone from the cross on: is a faithful presentation of the gospel is going to be met by lots of opposition. In fact, it's one of the signs that you are proclaiming the gospel effectively. Um, I remember years ago when I was getting ready for my doctoral defense in Paris, and I was telling the secretary in the office that I was kind of nervous, you know, about this this moment of a five-hour interrogation by these French professors, you know. And she looked at me and she goes, Eh bien, ce n'est pas le moment pour jeter des fleurs, which means... Well, it's not the time to throw flowers. Like, <laughs> if you throw in flowers at your pal, I mean, this is your doctoral defense. So, in a similar way, I would say to prospective evangelists, don't expect people to be throwing flowers at you as you declare Jesus crucified and risen from the dead. Some will respond with great enthusiasm, and some are going to throw bricks at you. Now, the, the digital version of bricks are these really obnoxious, snarky comments on um, on the page. Or on the screen. And and I know now from experience, uh, when I first started doing this, I didn't realize all these comments would come in. <laughs> and uh, especially the YouTube videos, but really anything you do, you know, you're always inviting comments. Religion? Come on. I mean, religion awakens the, the most powerful feelings people have, positive and negative. How many people come on to say, man, that was, I love what you said. That was the best well, once in a while, but they usually don't. They come on to say, ah, 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 yeah, ah, ah. so uh, 95% of the time, that's what you're going to get. I think it's part of the spirituality of it uh, in our world today is you got to steal yourself for a good amount of snarkiness. Now, here's the opportunity, and it really is a spiritual opportunity. Respond to contempt with warm heartedness. I just saw that in my friend um, Arthur Brooks. The head of the AEI, he uh, uh, he was uh, recommending that when you're faced with contempt, and that's what happens on, online, you get contempt from people. Not just, hey, what a bad argument you made. It's what a bad person you are. What a jerk you are. Why are you doing this? You know, swearing at you. When when you get contempt, respond with warm heartedness. Respond with, um, you know, an honest engagement of the argument, and maybe restate the position. Um, you know who's really good at that, I think, is our, our friend and colleague, Brandon Vaught. Watch Brandon as he works with sharp critics on his um, uh, Strange Notions page. Um, he's really good, I think, at that. He, he meets contempt with warm-heartedness. But it's like any and all missionaries up and down the centuries have faced far worse than snarky comments. So, you know, we can... Uh, we can man up and deal with it. And one thing that I've always taken to heart that you've said in the past is that those negative comments are signs that you're beyond the periphery, yeah. that you're going no. beyond your little bubble of safeness. Quite right. And I love that. That's what I think it was from the Holy Spirit when, you know, I was first so put off and, and you know, kind of hurt and dismayed. And why am I doing this? <laughs> you know, but I think it was the Holy Spirit who communicated that to my heart, which was, no, no, this is good, man. This is good. You can talk till the cows come home to nice Catholic groups who will politely applaud and smile and find what you say uplifting, and that's fine. But you really want to get out there in the wider world? You really want to declare the gospel to non-believers? You got to expect this kind of opposition. So, right, that's a good thing. And then, furthermore, see, it's like it's like fishing because once they comment, in a way, you got them hooked. All right, all right, and now okay, I can come back to you. I, I know you. You just gave me your your username or whatever it is, and I can address you, you know, directly. And I can send something right into your inbox, right into onto your screen. So in a way, it's like fishing. And if I, I'll use that image sometimes when there's someone really fighting with me, and I'll say, yeah, I got a really tough one on the end of the line now. I, I I hooked somebody, you know, and man, are they fighting me? Okay, okay, you're you're doing some deep sea fishing now. You're not you're not horsing around by the edge of the water pulling in a few minnows. 
you're out there in the in the depths and you got a, a tough, you know, swordfish on the end of the line. OK, man up and do it. Yeah, you know, I think also some advice for people listening is that, you know, many of them are struggling, perhaps thinking, I don't know my faith good enough, or I'm not intellectual enough to be able to answer these questions. Would you have any advice to, for people that kind of want to up their game intellectually and, and have more confidence when using the new media? Yeah, I'd say what Flannery O'Connor said when someone commented that, uh, you know, Catholics don't read the Bible. And she said, well, Catholics have two eyes and brains. So in other words, pick it up and read it. <laughs> so uh, you want to up your game? Great. There's a library of books out there on every aspect of theology. Go and read. Read and read and read and read the way Fulton Sheen did. Read and read and read the way Origen did, the way C.S. Lewis did, the way Thomas Aquinas did, the way G.K. Chesterton did. The great apologists and evangelists, uh, St. Paul. What did St. Paul do? He spent his whole life reading the Hebrew scriptures so that when the moment came, he knew how to interpret uh, Jesus as the fulfillment of those scriptures. Um, read, read, and read. And read, I'd say, in a careful, selective way. What I mean is don't just waste your time by picking up any old thing, but read the really great texts of the Catholic intellectual tradition. Um, life is short. Even even a heroic reader right, will get through, I don't know, 3,000 books in his life. I mean, a heroic reader, right? Think, heck, I might get plow through two books a week. Well, you have a long career as a reader. You might get through 3,000 books if you're really, really a, a hero and your eyes don't give up. Right? So my point is, when you read, read well. Don't read junk and don't read. Don't waste your time. Read the serious stuff. And um, you got two eyes and a brain, so do it. Well, now it's time for our listener question. Remember, if you have a question for Bishop Barron, go to askbishopbarron.com and record your question from any device, and perhaps you'll be featured on one of our upcoming episodes. Today's question comes from Chris from New Orleans, in which he asks about the possibility of excessive virtue. Hey, Bishop, I'm Chris from New Orleans. Earlier this year, you posted a video on St. Teresa of Calcutta. In it, you mentioned that all virtue, besides love, if done in excess, turns to vice. Um, I was wondering if you could elaborate more on that, because Aristotle defines virtue as the means between two extremes. And so if you were being truly virtuous, you wouldn't become the extreme on either side. So can you really have that? Yeah, good. Thank you for that. And um, yeah, it, it's an old... Um, issue in philosophy. So if you do play the Aristotelian thing, what I mean is, let's say, if you push courage all the way, you know, it'll turn into rashness. If you push prudence all the way, it can turn into a kind of a fussiness or, or a uh, inability to act. Um, you push faith all the way, it turns into fideism. You push hope all the way, it turns into presumption. Right. But what's the one virtue you can't push too far? Love, because love is what God is. So you can never say, but boy, that saint loves too much. <laughs> There's too much love on display in that saint's life. No, it's the one virtue in a way that can't be perverted through excess. Um, love all you want. Love all the time. Love without restriction. That's why Paul says there, there are three things that last, right? Faith, hope, and love. But in heaven, faith passes away. We won't need it. In heaven, hope passes, uh, passes away because we will have realized the, the goal. But what doesn't pass away? Love. Because love is the life of heaven. And heaven is an ever-expanding journey into the being and truth and beauty of God. It's an ever-expanding act of love, see? That's why love, by its very nature, can never be overstated. Well, thanks so much for tuning in to the Word on Fire show. Be sure to check out our website, www.wordonfireshow.com, for several links regarding the topic we discussed today. 
Also, I might mention that if you want to learn more about the necessity of the new media, be sure to check out Bishop Barron's series, Catholicism, the New Evangelization, in which Bishop Barron dives even deeper into our topic today and shows a few modern examples of how this call is being carried out. One last final thing, we have a free ebook for all of you by Bishop Barron entitled How to Discern God's Will for Your Life. Just go to bishopbarronbooks.com and you can download it for free today. Thanks again for listening and we'll see you back here next week on the Word on Fire show.